There is a good chance you might have noticed this already. I'm talking about the Sabbath school lesson for this week. It talks about the triune God. Why does this topic of the Trinity seem to show up everywhere? And is the God of the Bible really a triune God? Meanwhile, the Pope's encyclical has been showing up in the news recently. That's his encyclical about care for our common home, or his encyclical about the environment. Well, here is what he had to say about that. Pope Francis announced that the next document will be called Laudate Diem. About a month ago, he announced the theme. Yo estoy escribiendo una segunda parte de Laudato Si per aggiornare i problemi attuali. Now here is the really interesting question. What is the link between the Sabbath school lesson and the Pope's encyclical? In today's video, we will answer these questions and more. By the end of the video, you will understand better what is going on. Prepare to be surprised. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nader Mansour and this is Prove All Things. Today, we're looking at the Sabbath School lesson, in particular, lesson number two, which deals with the subject of the triune God. I want to highlight a few key points that stand out in this lesson and make some observations and commentary about them in light of what the Bible says. For example, in the first paragraph, we are told the following. But Jesus also helps us understand the centrality of the triune God to his mission. Did Jesus really do that? It's one thing to make a claim, it's another thing to actually look at the evidence. No matter how many Bible verses you might use, you will never find in any of them that Jesus talks about the triune God. Jesus never taught that God is a trinity. The concept that God is three in one is totally foreign, not just to the teachings of Jesus, but to the entire teachings of Scripture. But if we look at what Jesus actually said and what he taught about God, it is very obvious and it is very clear when we examine just a few verses. Jesus was emphatic that the God of the Bible is one, not a triunity. Notice what he said in a discussion with a scribe who came and asked him about the first commandment. And the discussion that follows gives us an insight about what Jesus understood and taught about who God is. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. This discussion between the two is very revealing. If you look at the context of the passage, you will find that they are talking about one individual person, that is, God the Father himself. The answer of the scribe makes that very clear and helps us understand exactly what Jesus meant. The scribe tells him that you have said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. That makes it very clear that they were talking about one individual person. So when Jesus said, the Lord our God is one Lord, and he was quoting from the Old Testament, he was referring to the one God and there is none other but he. That's not three persons. That's not a triune God. That is one individual person, his father. Jesus confirms that what the scribe understood was exactly what he meant, because just a little later he tells him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. It is very apparent that the God of the Bible, according to Jesus, was not a three-in-one God. It is not a trinity or a triune God. Someone will say, hold on brother, I heard a pastor or a theologian tell me that the word one here, which comes from the original Hebrew echad, does not mean single individual, it actually means unit or a compound or a collective. Christ was quoting from the Old Testament, the original of that is Hebrew. I want us to notice a contrast between what some theologians claim the meaning of words are and the discussion that Jesus is having with the scribe here, because Jesus understood Hebrew. Not only that, he was the divine son of God and he was speaking with a Hebrew scribe who understood the language. How did they understand the word echad? According to Jesus, he said, the Lord our God is one Lord, and in the Greek that's very clear, but the answer of the scribe cannot be disputed. 
He says, it's one God and none other but He. Echad means one individual person in that verse, according to Jesus and the scribe. And the context of the passage makes that very clear. They understood Hebrew better than what many scholars think they understand today when they make an opposite claim and come to a different conclusion about God and the worship of God. In sharp contrast to what this verse tells us plainly, here is the definition of the Trinity from the 28 fundamentals. Belief number two, it says, there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. According to this definition, which is what the Trinity is, it tells us that God is made up of more than one person, three persons. That is why it's necessary to change the plain meaning of Hebrew words such as echad. This definition is in sharp contrast to what we saw Jesus declaring very plainly. The alarming thing about this definition is that these terms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do not reflect a reality. That is, they are only titles. They are metaphors. The Father is not a real Father. He's just playing the role of a Father. The God person, referred to as the Son, is not a real begotten Son. He's just playing the role of a Son. And finally, there is a third God person who is the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three make up the one God as far as the Trinity is concerned. This is the triune God that is promoted in the lesson. I want to keep this in mind because the terms that are used, even though some of them might be biblical, they are explained in a non-biblical way. To advance error, Bible words and definitions have to be changed to accommodate the error. And so when we look at the title of this lesson that talks about the triune God, we really have to ask ourselves this question. Where does this triune God come from? Now we understand the definition of that as we saw the definition of the Trinity. Where is this three-in-one God coming from? It certainly doesn't come from the Bible because the word is not just missing in the Bible. The very concept of God being three-in-one is foreign to the Bible. You will not find it anywhere in the scriptures. So naturally, where did it come from? And how does it hold such a strong position, such a strong creedal position in the majority of the churches? You see, this concept originally comes from Babylon and it has been enshrined in tradition down through the years to the point that it has become so common today that anyone who dares to question it or ask questions about it is immediately deemed as a dangerous person with dangerous ideas. Now, if you want to find out more details about the origin of the Trinity and how it came from Babylon, I invite you to check out the video, The Trinity Gods of Babylon, available on our website. That will go into details that we don't need to repeat here. So the triune God is nothing other than the ancient sun God that comes from Babylon. Now, coincidentally, perhaps, or not, I don't know, but it just so happens that the lesson on the triune God is Sunday's lesson. It's the lesson people would study on Sunday and learn about the triune God. Now we saw that that's not in the Bible, but there is an interesting link here that I want to point out. The link between Sunday and the triune God. Now notice what Rome has to say about this. Catholic reasons for keeping Sunday. Because it's a day dedicated by the apostles to the honor of the most holy Trinity. Rome says they keep Sunday because of the God of Sunday. They call it the Trinity. And they claim that the apostles honored the Trinity. Now you will never find any such thing in the Bible. The apostles never honored the Trinity. They never had anything to say about the Trinity. They never worshiped the Trinity because they received their instruction from Jesus. And the instruction of Jesus was in harmony with all the Old Testament scriptures that were there before because all the scriptures testified of him. He came to fulfill. He never taught anything about God being a three-in-one God or a trinity. Anciently, in Babylon, sun worship, which happened on the day of the sun, the venerable day of the sun, has now traveled down through history 
has been enshrined in tradition, and in modern Babylon, we find the same thing. Worship on the sun day, the day of the sun, worshiping the same sun god. The modern name for that ancient sun god, according to Rome, is the Trinity. That is why you don't find it in the scriptures, and this helps us understand the origins of this idea. We'll find out more on that a little later on. Now, back in the lesson, in the middle of the lesson here, we have the first question, which quotes John chapter 20. This is where Jesus was speaking to his disciples after his resurrection. Before we read the verse, I want us to note the question, how should the understanding that mission finds its origin in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit shape our mission? The point here is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the triune God that we read the definition of earlier. That is, three individual persons who make up the one God. A three in one God. Each person is an individual. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So let's read that passage with that idea in mind and see what we can learn from the words of Jesus. John 20 verses 21 and 22. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Let's make some observations on this verse in light of the question, which claims that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as three co-eternal persons, are actually revealed in this passage. You quickly notice that the Holy Spirit is the breath of Jesus. That means it is the life of Christ, because the Spirit is life. This is the breath of spiritual life. This is not another person. This is not a different person. This is the very soul of the life of Christ. He breathed that on his disciples. To be clear, Jesus was not breathing another person. Not only that, but Jesus talks about the Father sending him. And in the same way, he would send the disciples. Now note this passage because this helps us understand the relationship that is described here and how that relates to us actually and what Jesus was revealing about the true God of the Bible. When Jesus says, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. I want to illustrate this so that it's very clear. According to Jesus, the Father is the one who sent him. That is, there is only one sender, not two. Only one individual person, God the Father, the God of the Bible, sent Jesus. And when he sent Jesus, he was with his son, as we will see. The sender is with the one who is sent. Jesus is sent by the Father, and the Father is with him. Now this is important because Jesus says, even so send I you, or in like manner. So whatever we understand about the relation of the Father sending Jesus, it will help us understand about what follows. So therefore, the Son is the sender for the believer, one sender, and the sender is with the one who is sent. He's with the believer and in the believer because that's actually how the Father was with the Son. It was the Father's Spirit that was in the Son. The Son's Spirit is in the believer. That's why Jesus said, or he breathed on his disciples rather, and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now this connection between the Father, the Sender, and the Son being sent, and the Father being with him, was made very apparent at one significant event in the life of Christ. I'm referring, of course, to the baptism of Christ. The baptism of Christ is many times used to prove that God is a trinity. People say the Father was in heaven, Christ was on earth, the Spirit was between heaven and earth, there is the trinity right there. But Jesus explains the baptism in a very different way to what many people conclude about it. Here are his words in John 5 and verse 37. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Jesus was here speaking to the unbelieving Jews, who despite the witness of John, and despite the miracles that the Father performed through Jesus, still did not believe. And Jesus is referring to the fact that had they witnessed the baptism, they still would not have believed because he's referring to an event where the Father bore witness of him with a voice and with a shape, but they did not hear that voice. And even if they did, it would not have made a difference, because they had not the Word of God abiding in them. But this event here 
is clear that Jesus is making an, a commentary and giving an explanation about the baptism. At the baptism, the father bore witness of his son, the father and no one else. And the father bore witness in two ways, by his own voice, and we know what he said, and by his own shape. That is, the shape that was sent from heaven, that came down like a dove, was credited to the Father according to Jesus. It was the Father who sent that shape, not a different person to the Father. It was God who was responsible for both voice and shape. Now, of course, that shape that descended on Christ, we know that that is the Holy Spirit. Light and glory from the very presence of God came down upon his Son in the shape and in the form of a dove and descended on him like a dove. And that is the work of the Father, not a different person to the Father. John tells us the meaning of that. In John 1, 32, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. The Spirit came down on Christ, and it remained on him. And remember, according to Jesus, the Father was responsible for sending the Spirit. Just like the voice of God is his own voice, not a different person to him, so the shape that God sent, that is, his Spirit, is his own Spirit and not a different person to him. The key here that John is emphasizing is that the Spirit abode upon Christ. That means it remained upon Christ. Christ was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, according to Jesus, what is the identity of that Holy Spirit that he received? Who was it that was in Christ when Christ received the Spirit? Was it the Father or was it someone else? Was it a different person to him? The answer is very clear in a number of places. Here is just one of them. John 8, 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. According to Jesus, again, there's only one sender, and that is the Father. And the sender is with the one who is sent. The Father hasn't left him alone. How was the Father with Christ? Well, he was in his Son by giving him his own spirit in a very marked manner at the baptism with the descent of that shape in accompaniment with the voice that was spoken and both are credited to the Father. So according to Jesus, the identity of the Holy Spirit that abode on him and was in him is really his Father. Jesus in his ministry would declare that the Father which dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The Apostle Paul said, God was in Christ. And so the sender is with the one who is sent. That's why the name of Christ is also Emmanuel. That is, God the Father with us through his Son. How was he with us through his Son? By giving the Son his very own Spirit, which was his very own person, not a different person to him. Hence the words of Jesus, his shape and his voice. Now, if we go back to our diagram, this will now make it very clear as to the relationship between the sender when it comes to the Son and the believer who is sent. Just as the Father was in the Son, so now the Son, the sender, will be in the believer and with the believer. And Jesus made that very clear in his famous words in Matthew when he said, And lo, I am with you always. Jesus said, I am with you, not someone else. To illustrate that, he breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. How is Jesus going to be with the disciples? By giving them his very own spirit, his very own life, his very own presence, his personal presence. Keep in mind that Jesus is still Emmanuel. That is, the Father is in him. That is why the Father sent his spirit upon his son at the baptism to signify that in a very marked, visible manner. And this is why Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit to signify the same thing in a very visible manner. And that was, of course, fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples received fully the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't a different person to Christ. It was the very presence of Christ, his very own breath, Emmanuel, God 
with us. So when you receive Emmanuel, you are receiving the very presence of God in the Son, and thereby you are empowered to go on mission and reconciled to God as well. Now back to the lesson. The first part of the lesson makes the point that the Spirit was sent after Jesus went. And the Spirit is someone different to the Father and the Son, a different person to them. It's not the Father, it's not the Son. Now the verses that are used to support that are from John 14 and the chapters that follow, where Jesus was speaking about the other comforter. It's interesting that contrary to what people conclude as to the identity of the other comforter, Jesus in the same passage was very clear as to who this other comforter is. Here's what he said in John 14, 18. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. The other comforter is no one other than Jesus. It's not a different person to Jesus, it's Christ in another form. It's Christ who will be with his disciples in another way. That's why he breathed on them, that's why he says, I will come to you. Now I'll be dealing with those chapters in more detail in an upcoming video. If you'd like to be notified about that, be sure to subscribe and you'll find out as soon as it's published. Now it's interesting, and like I said, some of these things really stand out to me. The triune God is repeated throughout this lesson three times. The three in one God and the triune God is emphasized three times. Now I don't know if this is coincidental or intentional, but these things just jump out at me. It's just, there is three repeated there. Is, what's the reason? For emphasis, that's the main point. The emphasis that the God of the Bible is really the triune God. And the reference to him or to them as the triune God more so than referring to them as the Trinity. Now that's interesting, but they're talking about the same thing. Now this brings us to the interesting connection that I referred to earlier. And that's the connection with the encyclical of the Pope. In 2015, the Pope issued the encyclical. Just recently, a few days ago, in October of 2023, he issued part two of that encyclical, as he told us earlier, and it's all about the climate crisis. When we look at the encyclical of the Pope, what is the foundation for it? Does it have anything to do with the God that is worshipped? And the answer is yes, and the findings are alarming. Here's what it says in that encyclical. The Trinity and the relationship between creatures. Consequently, when we contemplate with wonder the universe in all its grandeur and beauty, we must praise the whole Trinity. As we look at nature, as we look at all of creation, that leads us to praise the whole Trinity. We must praise the whole Trinity. The credit for creation is given to the Trinity. This is the God that is worshipped in Rome. This is the equivalent and the modern day form of ancient Babylon and the sun worship that took place there. Not only is praise given to the Trinity for creation, but this is all about worship. In other words, protecting the environment and saving the environment and with this whole environment crisis agenda has at its foundation an issue of worship to the Trinity. Not only that, but the Pope concludes his encyclical with a prayer. Here it is, a Christian prayer in union with creation. He prays and he says, Triune Lord, wondrous community of infinite love, teach us to contemplate you in the beauty of the universe, for all things speak of you. He is praying to the Trinity. This is the triune God, a wondrous community. That's a unity of three co-equal, co-eternal persons. Now here's the alarming thing. The Pope gives worship and praise to the Trinity for creation. He prays to the triune Lord, this community. The lesson makes the same emphasis talking about the same God. This is alarming. It is a dangerous thing when these two churches represented here worship the same triune God. And someone will say, no, it's not the same God. The facts and the evidence tell a different story. It is actually the same triune God. It's the same Trinity that is worshipped. You want to see the evidence for yourself? Check out this video, the SDA Catholic Trinity, also available on our website. So what will you do in light of this? Why not listen to Jesus? In Mark chapter 7, Jesus said, 
Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Will you favor tradition or the truth? Will you play it safe and side with the majority? Or will you dare to follow the Lamb wherever he might lead? I invite you to abandon the traditions and the commandments of men. It's time to fear and worship the true God, the God of creation, not a philosophical idol enshrined in his place. After all, that's what the three angels' messages are all about, aren't they? Prove all things, hold fast that which is good.